Hello and welcome to part three of our CSS final project video support. And this one is going to focus on the custom.css style sheet. The first two were focused on the common. And remember that these particular styles are targeted towards particular styling needs on one page out of this six page website. So we can begin by looking here at the grading sheet and we see that in the custom styles area which is a total of 60 points there are three different requirements on three different pages one on the events page one on the fact page and one on the services page so let's get to it we'll start with the events page there's a calendar on that page you might remember from seeing it in the browser we're asked to produce five rules to format table headings days of the week date numbers empty day cells and events. That sounds like a mouthful and not entirely clear perhaps on what we need to really do code wise unless we first make sure we break down that table into its component parts and also look at the HTML code underneath it. We'll begin by looking in the browser and here's the events page with the table that we're trying to style and we're talking about several different components of it. First of all the month and year area at the very top then you have these headings across the next row that contain the days of the week. That's another element that you're going to be styling. And then you have the days in the calendar that don't have a date. For June 2017, that would be the first four days as well as the last day, June having only 30 days. So something in common for those days. And then also we want to be able to style the date numbers themselves. And then lastly, the events that are happening during some of those days. And of course, you have a requirement HTML wise to put some more of those types of events themed to your particular hotel in the Friday, Saturday area. So you'll have more of those to style up, although the same styling codes required regardless of how many you might have. So with that all in mind, now the next thing we need to do is really examine the code so that we can figure out what kind of selectors we might want to use to style up those individual components we just discussed. So back now to the editor where we can examine the code for that events page. Now if we scroll up towards the top of the table, we'll see that a key component here is that the table itself has an ID of calendar. Then if we examine inside the table, the first row you can see here, that's the one that contains June 2017. That particular element is a TH and it has an ID of month year. So we could just stick to the IDs primarily where we can use them. Now the next row down contains an ID of weekdays and then each table header TH inside that second row of the table where the days of the week are has a class of weekday. So we have weekdays, an ID, and weekday, a class with seven of them for each of the days of the week. Then we move down into the data portion of the table where the calendar actually exists. And remember that we have some days in that first week. Each week now is represented by a row. And in that first week, remember that we had the first four days of June in that calendar being blank. And there's a class of no day in there. Typically what's done with that is a background image to fill in that empty space. And you'll see that in some of the examples that I show you in a little bit. Continuing on though, some of these days of the week are going to have some events on them. And here's one that we saw earlier in the browser. That would be June 7th in this particular case. The event is that children stay free that day. And you can see the key here is that you can code up the class of event and then all of the events that are filled in with some text will obey that particular rule. And then as we scroll down through, the rest is just a repeat of what we've seen. Some days that have events, some days that don't. They all, though, have a date. And remember that one of the things we want to style up is the actual date number. And so that's just a class of date. There's a little div inside the TD that has a class of date and you can see every day of the month has that and as we continue to scroll down eventually we get to the last week of the month and we have a TD at the very end which happens to be where the 31st would go there's no date of that kind for June so we have a class of no day on that one 
And notice also, I just happen to put these non-breaking spaces into those table cells because some browsers act a little squirrely with a table cell that has nothing in it at all. So a non-breaking space kind of takes care of that problem. So that gives you a quick tour of all of the existing elements within that events table and all of the various classes and IDs that will help you to select them. Okay, now to get some ideas, we're going to go back to the browser and I'm going to show you what's called a gallery of print screens or a gallery of screenshots. And you can see the URL here. I also have a link to it in Blackboard on the homepage. And what you can see is some examples of how previous students have styled up those particular areas that you're required to do. For example, here is a events page styled up. And if we focus attention on those separate areas, you can see, for example, the month and year has been styled up with a white colored text with a gray background and then the days of the week have been styled with the white against a black background and then the no days have been styled up to have a gray background with a gray sword and by the way if these graphics look bad that's kind of the whole point of this this is minecraft hotel so you can see the kind of uh, Lego graphics expectation level is not too high, so this is a perfectly good choices for graphics. At any rate, you can also see the date numbers have been aligned to the right in their cells, and the text for the events has been styled up with uh, center alignment and a dark gray. Uh, you can see again, this is a different year, this is December of 2012, so that's why we have different number of days that are at the beginning and ending of this calendar showing up with that background. Again, you would have just the first four and the last one um, picking up that style. At any rate, uh, we'll see if we can find another one that might be worth looking at here. Here we go. It's pretty common to see the background image being used in the no days because you don't have any text to go over it so you don't have to worry about nice contrast like you do in some of these event cells but by scrolling through and taking a look at the events page on any of those examples you can get some pretty good ideas here we have it looks like the table is given a certain amount of opacity to see through into the background image which is kind of a cool effect and then you have the bats as the background image on those no days. And you can see here a little bit different approach to the date numbers where there's a little background, a border, and then white text used for the numbers. So that's a nice dramatic looking table uh, styling result there. Pretty nice job. Okay, so the same goes for looking at other areas. Just, just we happen to be looking at the events here, but... You can take a look at the treatment of testimonials on each one of these pages. Of course, they each have it because it's on every page. So you can get a good idea of some different stylings for any of the areas that you are required to do just by kind of scrolling through and maybe picking up some ideas that might be helpful in your own creativity. Now let's go back to the actual style sheet itself and start looking at those possible selectors. So here we are back in the editor and we want to kind of go back and forth between the concept of the selectors and the actual HTML. So here's where our table begins. Remember, it's ID of calendar. So if you want to put some kind of styling on the table itself, it's going to be hashtag calendar and then hashtag month year for that top line and weekdays or weekday for each individual day that you see as those headings. So let's go back now to custom.css. Now you'll notice at the top area of custom, there are already a bunch of styles here those are given to you. You should probably just leave them alone, but you could slightly adjust them if you need to or want to for whatever reason. But I think it's best to just leave those alone. And when we scroll down further, we can see those three areas that you need to style. And here's some more notes about the five different rules and the areas that you're trying to work on. So the table heading itself is the first one, and then the weekdays, date numbers, empty days, and events are the five. So the first one is the table heading. Okay, the table heading is the month year. Might not be a bad idea just to select the ID, control C there to copy, and then put your hashtag, control V to paste, and then you've got your selector. All right, so that's where you could style up that main heading. All right, next would be the weekdays. So weekdays, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday headings. And by the way, there are different selectors that would also work here, right, for the Looking, let's first of all remind ourselves. 
So you could potentially just put some kind of style on the TR. For example, if it's a font, it'll carry into the THs, uh, but not everything would. So it kind of depends on what you want to do. If you were going to put a background, for example, putting it on the TR would act differently than putting it on each separate TH. Uh, so at any rate, lots of different possibilities. But if you just want to do weekday, for example, then dot weekday would work. Are there other things that would work? Sure. How about th dot weekday since it is a th or table space weekday or hashtag calendar space dot weekday it's the weekday class inside the table calendar so there's a lot of different things that would work my thought is let's keep it simple it's probably better for you that way so all the weekdays pick that up since it's a class, and that would take care of that weekdays requirement there. Now, how about the date numbers? All right, let's go back to the events page. The date numbers are in a div inside each normal day. So you have some choices here. Date is the div that contains the one itself, the two, the three, whatever the date number is. And because you might want to put like a border around it, Using the div is probably a good idea, rather than using day itself. Depends. If you want to put a font on there again, you could apply it more surrounding area. But probably dot date would be a good way to go there. So dot date is going to work for us there. And then empty days. Empty days we've seen has normally been a background image and or color. Let's see what selector would work. In that first row, we can see the four no day TDs, and then also we have another one at the very end. There it is. It doesn't really matter where they are. It's going to be the same class dot no day that should work for it. So back to custom dot no day, meaning it's an empty day cell and is a perfect candidate for a background image. And then lastly, we want to pick up the events. So let's take a look at how the events are coded up. We can see example of an event. You'll have more of them after you've done your HTML modifications and added some events into the Fridays or Saturdays. But at any rate, they will all have a class of event and therefore a selector of dot event to style those event texts. So let's come back here and add that in. So dot event will work there. So those are your five required style rules. At least they will be rules after you add some styling to them. You always want to keep your theme in mind and your color scheme and go for it, whatever it might be. No sense in being subtle here. You can see how a lot of the previous students' works are really dramatic, and that's kind of the fun of it, and you get the best results from that type of enthusiastic approach towards your theme. All right, so let's now move into the next section. The next one's a little less complex because we're just talking about questions and answers. The requirements for this one are pretty straightforward. We need to style the questions differently from the answers. This is a frequently asked questions page, so that makes sense. Visually, you want to be able to see the difference. You want to have consistency from a question at the top of the page and down to the bottom of the page. So let's take a look at the code for that page, the fact page. And you can see here that it's filled with these paragraphs, p tags, where the class is either question or answer. And it's back and forth, of course, question, answer, question, answer, and so on. So this can be pretty easy. We're just going to have dot question and dot answer to pick up those. So your requirements are to really make those two look unique from one another. And maybe the questions should stand out normally. So let's go into custom and see. Our selectors are pretty easy here. Dot question and dot answer. So pretty simple selectors. The challenge, if there is one, is in what properties might you use. Okay, so if you're wondering about what properties maybe to set and what your requirements are, um, let's go to the grading sheet and we'll see that the requirement is to use at least two declarations for each of those questions and answers to make them distinct from one another. And I would say things to consider there might be font weight. You could make one bold and one not. Um, you could also change font size. 
Uh, you could change colors. You can change the way it's indented or set it off with margins. Uh, you could use borders, but that might get a little bit too uh, busy. So you have some uh, possible, you know, even background color differences. So there are a lot of possibilities there to emphasize one and keep it distinct from the other. You just need to use two in each case to get full credit as long as it's, uh, and it's possible, you know, of course, when you're talking about colors, think about your theme colors and maintain good contrast always between text and background, especially with a page like this because people are going to be reading it and need to read the entire question and answer. Okay, so let's move on to the third and last of the requirements on this custom style sheet, and that's the services page. And we're going to have a couple of images on that page. Those are images that you're going to be supplying, and here in this case, we're formatting them. The requirements are to float one of them to the left and another one to the right, and then give margins on the inner side to kind of keep it away from the text. All right, so to get a better idea of what this page looks like and what we're trying to accomplish with these floating of these images left and right and so on, let's take a look in the browser at the initial page that we're given to start with. And you can see here it is. We've got a room service image and a spa image. Obviously, these are the ones that you're given as a starting point. You're going to be replacing them, hopefully with some images that you can find that depict some kind of food room service type of picture that fits your theme and some kind of spa type image that fits your theme. It really is pretty wide open. If you can find something that really relates to your theme well, that's fine. The key here is styling it. So you're asked to float one to the left, float the other to the right, and then the text is going to be naturally wrapping around it in the opposite direction. And then you just want to kind of keep the text from getting too close to this. And then we have also some text that's a caption uh, below the images, and we want to format that as well. So it's kind of a combo of the image and the caption text below, as well as the text that's going to be wrapping around to be um, styled appropriately. So with that all in mind, we have also classes that we can use. Uh, the images we'll see have the same class, so if we want to put a border on them, we can treat them with the same border using the class, but when we're floating one left and one right, we have to use the IDs in each case. So some of the styling is different and some of it's the same. So when it's the same, we use the class. When it's different, we'll use the ID. Let's go back now to the code for it. And I think seeing the code now for the services page will help us figure out what exactly those selectors will be. So here is the first part where we have the figure. So the images are within a figure tag. The figure carries an ID, room service, fig for figure. Uh, the ID itself, room service pick. It's also got a class of service pick which matches the same class of the other image for the spa. So again, uh, we have a caption in there as well, inside the figure. So we have some selectors we can play with for both of those. If we scroll down further, we'll see a similar kind of structure for the spa image. And here it is. Here's the spa paragraph text. And you can see similarities and differences. We have a spa fig, we have a service fig, and we have a spa pick service pick. So again, you can use classes for stuff that's the same, and you can use the IDs for stuff that's different. All right, now let's go to custom.css, talk about those selectors. So again, we need to use the figure's ID to float them left or right. So the figure's ID, so down spa fig, and I guess the room services fig is actually above it in the code, although it really doesn't matter about the order of these. So there you have it, room service fig and spa fig. Those are the selectors that could be floated left or right. Um, doesn't matter which one you float right and which one you float left, but one should go one way and one should go the other. 
um, and then we're going to give a margin on that same figure to the side to keep it separated from the text. Okay, because you know when you float something, the text is going to come up and interact with it. And then we also need to give common border properties to the images, and we're asked to give a border style other than solid. So we need to be a little, little creative with the border properties that we use here. Now you could put a border on the figure, but I think a border on the image is probably going to work better. Let's take a look at the actual HTML for the image. So inside the figure is the image. The image has a class of service pick. Both the spa and the room service share that service pick. You can see it there and there. So that's the class we want to use to set a common border service pick. Dot service pick. So there you have it. There may be other things you might want to do in here, but you can float left, set margin right, float right, set margin left, set border. Uh, and that border border properties are pretty wide open. How you got thickness, you got color, and you got style. And the style is where we're told not to do solid. All right. So with our discussions here of the events, fact and services pages. We pretty much have completed the requirements of custom.css and uh, I want to show you one more thing before we call it quits here and that is that for some of these properties some of the more recent ones that have been added into the CSS spec we call that CSS3 pretty much is the new stuff. A lot of those properties are more complicated than what you can just remember and type in. So I want to show you a nice website tool to generate some CSS that's a little bit more complicated and allow you to get the effects that you're interested in without so much trial and error. And one of those is called CSS Gen. So we're going to go take a look at that. Uh, CSS3 Generator and CSS Gen for short. And you can see the URL, css3gen.com. Um, there are a lot of these generator tools out there. This is a particularly nice one, I think, and it works well for our needs. You can create, for example, gradient backgrounds, the rounded corners on a box, which you could use for testimonials. We can also do text shadowing to give a kind of 3 day effect on things like headings. Any box can be given the same type of shadow as you can for text. And these are just complicated properties involving a lot of numerics that you wouldn't just typically come up with in your head. There's also some CSS transforms that you can do. They're pretty cool. You can also do some background generation stuff and CSS3 animation. So there's uh, quite a bit you can do from here, but let's just pick out something basic as an example. We'll do the text shadow generator. So you could apply this type of style to your heading. So you pick the type of thing you want to play with, and you get some sliders to set things the way you want. No thanks and then it generates the code for you. So for example, if you want to do text shadowing, you can set the angle here just by dragging. The angle is the angle of the shadow. So like the shadow is above the text now, shadow is below the text now, and to the right as well. And that will set your degrees there. And the distance, that's for the shadow. You can see how far the shadow is. So you just play with it and get the effect that you are interested in. And it puts the distance in there and it's also going to create the CSS for us. The amount of blur, so if you want a really sharp shadow or you want a blurry shadow, you're just going to set that slider in place the way you want it. And then you can also set a color for the shadow. You might look up a number and type it or you can just kind of play with these things. If I want a, a, a bluish shadow, I've got that now. And the opacity of the shadow will allow it to bleed through to a background. Um, we don't need to really worry about that, but you can see that you can you can kind of see it have different effects depending on your background on your page by setting that opacity. So when you're done there with that, you scroll down and you see that it has generated CSS for you. So this is the text shadow property. I would simply copy that and I can paste it into my code. Now, of course, your code needs to have a selector, but we could paste this in. So I'll copy that and then I'll paste it into see we could go to common.css let's go down to heading styles and this for example if I want to put this in 
as part of my H1, H2, H3 styles. I've already got my selector, and I can just paste that text shadow that we just did right in there. Now, if I save this, and we look back in the browser at our page, and we refresh, we just see these headings take on that text shadowing, and there it is. You can see that kind of blue text shadowing coming up on all my headings. It's going to come up on all my headings throughout the website. So you can see them there. Now, you wouldn't want it on your basic text, or it would be impossible to read it, but it's not bad on these headings like that. The point being, CSS3 Gen is a nice site. It gives you easy interface sliders and whatnot to these kinds of complicated property settings and allows you to just copy and paste it in. So use CSS3 Gen for some of the more complicated style properties or some other uh, website that you prefer. All right, so that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to cover. And again, take a look through the screenshots for some other ideas about things. And uh, good luck on your completion of the final project. I'll be anxiously awaiting their submissions and interested to see what you guys came up with to uh, put your themes into effect. Thanks for watching.